Hi, Tom Martino, Martino Motorsports, Ryan Martino, Martino Motorsports. We're here at the famed ghost track of Ohio Drag City, Youngstown, Ohio, also called Meander. Why is it called Meander? Well, the Meander Reservoir is on the other side of that tree line, and that's the water supply for the city of Youngstown. So instead of saying Ohio Drag City, they used to just say, we're gonna see it Meander. So Tom, growing up, you had two choices, race on the street, race on the track. You obviously kept it on the track, which I'm very proud of you for doing. Let's talk a little bit about this area and how people congregated. Some people raced on the street, some people raced on the track. You did a great job of influencing some of those people to stay off the street and get it to the track. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, something about this area in Ohio is everybody was territorial. The guys from Struthers, Ohio, where I'm from, we all hung out at the Burger Chef. Probably never even heard of a Burger Chef. Guys on the south side, McDonald's. Guys on the west side, they had their place to hang out. Guys downtown, Youngstown, from the north side, east side, they used to hang out at a place called the Town Burger. A lot of Hemi cars in downtown. A lot of Hemi cars. So you go to the, you'd hang out after school at, at, at the restaurant, shoot the bull, talk the crap, see you at the track on Friday night. We used to come out here and settle all our, all our grievances, all our problems here at the racetrack. But that's not saying there wasn't street racing going on, but we didn't partake in that. Wink, wink. So now there was four or five speed shops in town too. So if you broke your parts, we didn't have some in our jigs. We had other, we had to stay local. Right. Back then, Jigs was in Columbus, Ohio, and from Youngstown, Ohio, the Columbus is a million miles away. Midwest Auto Parts had catalogs, and they were on the south side. Gratz Brothers Speed Shop, Poland, Ohio. Youngstown Speed and Custom, south side. So those guys always had their teams, too. So you race with Team Gratz, Team Speed and Custom, Midwest Auto Parts, and then the mail order stuff was like Gratchet out of, out of Detroit, Mancini Racing out of Detroit. They all had ads in the magazines. So there was no Summit, no Jags, no internet, no computers. So you bought a lot of used stuff, a lot of horse trading, and a lot of stuff at the track. So until you made it to the NHRA Spring Nationals of Columbus, Ohio, this was as big as it got was right here. You were large and in charge if you were at Meander Raceway on a Friday night or Saturday night racing. I always talk about, you know, how school we are at the racetracks and the facilities, using Bader as the top senior in today's society with going up to Summit Motorsports Park. Now there's a couple of rumors about this place that I've heard over the years that when you're on the starting line, you, you talked about kicking the bricks over some guys so they would have a starting line disadvantage or advantage. What about when they plugged in their fryer over there at the concession stand? That was another, that's a nobody's urban legends. Before the trans brake here, we all had to foot brake our cars. So Carl Ross or Ross of Transmission was doing trans brakes. I drove a Dodge Dart that was built in Struthers, Ohio by Jerry Morrell. Little story about Jerry. He's building the car and he's I'm telling him, he's got all these pictures of all these championship cars on the walls. Jerry, here's a picture of the car. Can't get a picture up there till you win a race. You can't get on the wall till you win a race. Jerry Morrell was the crew chief for Lou Blaney, legendary sprint car and stock car driver. Dale Blaney, Dave Blaney's dad, NASCAR champion. So Jerry built all these race cars and he used to ride me hard. You ain't get a picture on the wall until you win a race. Here it goes. First night out with a brand new race car. Dodge Dart, all chassis car, full roll cage, strut front end, four lane suspension. Come out to Meander, win the first night. Going back to the days of no cell phones. Get home two o'clock in the morning, call Jerry in bed. Jerry, Tom Martino. Yeah, what's wrong? Cold sleep. I said, you can put my picture up tomorrow. We won the first night out. Goodbye, I love you. Hang the phone up. True story. Another story out here is going back to the transmissions. Nobody had trans brakes. Carl Rosser was doing turbo 400s. We put an adapter plate in the car, run a turbo 400 with a trans brake. Ricky Ford's one of the first guys ever to run a delay box and a transmission brake. So we used to stand on the starting line, take a stopwatch, and time the tree, time the tree. Urban legend, every time Alex would fire up the coffee machine or the french fry machine, the starting light would take a short and the timers would go out of sequence and the tree was never the same way. Well, we proved that theory wrong because we timed it and 
Ricky and I won a lot, a lot of races out here with delay boxes and trans brakes. That's amazing that you and Ricky still have a great relationship. In fact, the Melnicks, we still run the NHRA and PD area with them. There's a lot of people that came out of this track that had a lot of success over the years. Mark Abruzzi, you name it. And you know, look in the back, they have a lot of archive photos and videos from these tracks available on YouTube and some great Facebook pages as well. And we always enjoy sharing memories from these uh, track experiences we had. There wasn't too many cameras back then. I think Brian Epps even got a start down here. Brian Epps started here. He used to drive up from Ken and he, he took pictures all night long out here. And he, he made his first million dollars take shooting pictures here at Ohio Drag City in Quaker City. So I know Brian, you're, I hope you're home watching this because I'm sure you remember coming out here. He must have been 16, 17 years old with a 35 millimeter camera. He's the only guy I know in drag race that ever made any money at drag race. <laughs> so looking back at some of those photos, obviously this was probably one of my first at track experiences here in the 80s. Uh, a lot of the marketing partners that we have today, three or four of them are still with us today. Mickey Thompson Tires, Strange Engineering, you mentioned Carl Russell, Ross from Transmission. It's great that we're able to have marketing partners that have been with us throughout our racing career. In fact, if some of the ones we had today were with us back then, we would have been dominating every weekend. Yeah, back, you, you're talking 19... 70, 69, 70. I've been doing this for 50 years and finally made it to the top of my field. So anybody out there that's thinking it might, it's not an overnight success, but you gotta come out. Everybody's got an Ohio Drag City track in their background. There's the guys in the Carolinas got them, the guys in Southern Kentucky got them. There's a hometown track where everybody started somewhere. And this is where we started. And not to say that it was all fun and good times. A lot of guys crashed, a lot of guys went out in the weeds and come back with a busted race car. Uh, another urban legend, one of the guys went back there four-wheeling before first round. We couldn't find him, the full cards. Where's this kid at? He's laying up there inside a hill on his four-wheeler with a broken leg. We had to go up there and get him. So there was a lot of good good memories out here. Do I wish it was still open? Heck yeah, this is, this is fun. But you watch the No Prep Kings on TV, yeah, the Street Outlaws. This is the original, not the original, no prep drag strip in America. All they had was a little shake of rosin, and that's it. that was set the track. If you broke a transmission, if you blew a motor, Alex would come out with his van, paper towels, and some, and, and some grease sweep, clean it up. Then he took two orange cones and he moved the groove over. So you're racing over there today, two hours later, you might this might be the groove over here. You don't know. Because Alex said, we didn't have the way to clean the mess up. So all Alex would do was just wipe it up with the paper towels, throw some grease sweep down, and then we would just move the groove over just a little bit. Move now, it over two inches and just straddle the tranny. Now are we spoiled in today's society? We go to these races that are nationally sanctioned races, and people are complaining left and right about this little blip here, this little blip here, all this and that. And you had to put a sports construction cone out there. Nobody complained. So you just moved the lane over and the groove over and you guys were racing there all night long and everybody was happy. Another thing, if you notice that, we're in the middle of nowhere. We're on an, air, an, 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 an airport landing strip. There was a, a midnight curfew out here. Every, you had to be done by midnight. So about nine, 10 o'clock at night in the fall, the fog would roll in. And Alex will tell you, just keep moving, it's the vortex effect. Just keep these cars going on the track, we'll keep the fog up, we'll keep the fog up. And we'd be running it, and you couldn't see the guy next to you. I mean, the fog's coming in, but we're still racing. Who knew, who knew back then? But we had to be done by midnight or there was a split. So if you didn't, if you if you wanted your money, you hot lap, and you can back off the return road and come back up. Another little sidebar about Ohio Drag City. Back then we didn't have computers, no computers. So whatever the announcer announced, the kid was an ET shack at the end of the track. And he'd sit in there with a set of headphones on and a and a ink pen and a piece of paper, and he would handwrite your slips down. So you get a slip with your ET on it, and that make-believe mile per hour slip that you just set, and during eliminations it had a W or an L on it, and they would circle it. If you won, you had a W. If you had the L, you lost, you went back to the trailer. And if you red lighter, you, you got the loss. But it was all handwritten, and there was always mistakes. There was always a throwdown with the kid at the ET shack, because if he didn't like you, 
he tell you, he, he give you a lost slip and tell you you broke out by two because there was no way to know what your ET was because there was no scoreboards back then. Racing had to be a lot more fun back then when it was not so scientific. Oh, yeah, it's just nobody knew what reaction time was. You see a guy get a light and you go, hey, that was a great light. That was a great run. The car hooked up good. Now with computers, everything's scientific. Now you got data you don't need to know, but you have it at your at, at the tip of your finger on a, on a laptop. I find it funny. You told that story about Timmy Brooks with, uh, you know, he runs Predator Pro Mod. And the guys would be in the concession stand and look up, and you said he would be driving through the grass down here, pulling gears, not even missing a beat. Oh, that was on this side of the track. You, you heard him leave the track, and you heard gravel flying, and you look, there's dust flying, and there's old Timmy Brooks, man, just ripping that transmission, throwing dust, come back on the track, and try to take the stripe, because there's no boundaries. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of guys went off the edge of the track out here. No, I can't think of any fatalities out here, to my memory. I mean, it was a safe place to work. Alex loved everybody. George loved everybody. They put their, they, they, this was their paycheck for six months a year. This is how they made their money, paid their bills with racing this track. Now we're at the finish line. That's the return road right there, back to the pits, right there off the track. That's the short return road. There's a long return road down there by the dumpsters. But you can tell the track is fairly level. I mean, it, it, we race on worse tracks than this in the IHRA days. I'm gonna tell you, we've been on worse tracks than this all over the country. But it's a good place to learn how to set a chassis up. If it weren't here, it worked anywhere. Just ask Ricky Forge. He, he'd leave here and go to an NHRA national event and do real good because the car worked here. He got the tire pressure, the full length set up here, and he was able to compete everywhere. Now, this track closed in the later uh, 80s and they tried to reopen it in the 90s. The last time we were out here, I was with you, and we brought our, our dragster then. We were sponsored by Coors and Farmore. Had a great outing. That was a big, heavy-hitting car in the IHRA and NHRA sanctioned series. We're in the 890s, and I can't even imagine bringing that super comp dragster down here and running without guardrails, with the narrow lanes. But throughout my racing career with you, I've seen some of these tracks we run, and there's a couple of tracks out in New York that had slimmer lanes than this, and you say, I don't even care. I've been down to Drag City. I can get down any track in the world. So that still holds true to the day. Yeah, there's not a problem. I mean, this is all we had. We didn't know four-link tune-ups. We didn't know shock settings. We didn't know how to pull timing. We didn't know how to add timing. This was the, a big block motor, big block Dodge, big block Chevy, big block Ford, single four barrel, dual point distributor, a coil, just put it in if the car fires, we're going racing. It, it's just an honor to walk on this track with you. I mean, you've had a great racing career. A lot of people in NHRA, PDRA, and IHRA had very successful uh, ranks joining you as a world champion. I can remember coming out here to track with Harry O and Mike Dvorak, uh, the Melanix. I mean, there was just always a friendly face. We always pitted in the same area, but always had people visiting throughout the night. And it was just a fun experience, not to mention the Tootsie Rolls were always a hit with me. I can remember sitting, uh, you know, in the back of the van with an open trailer, and we're spoiled today with these motorhomes and trailers. Could kind of isolate yourself, but you know, those these are memories that we'll have for a lifetime. We work with the Mahoney Valley Historical Society and, and preserving some of this, so hopefully, that we're able to carry some of these memories from this generation through my generation to the next generation, and we're able to just uh, keep the chain of links so this track doesn't disappear in the history of drag racing. This track built champions. We're lucky to be champions, thanks to Tom Martino.